Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cybos 2024 in Beijing. And we're at the Chainlink booth. I'm Liz Lumley, and today I'm speaking to Nikki uh, Arasinga, who is business development head for APAC and Middle East for Chainlink Labs. How are you? Good, thanks, Liz. How are you? Very good. Well, the thing I always like to ask people at shows like this is what are people talking about on the floor? You know, in the meetings and, you know, not on the, the big stage, but what are you hearing from people at the show today? Yeah, so it's amazing to hear even on day one, just after the first morning that I think we're seeing the emergence of one of the key trends that we've talked about a lot in the blockchain and digital asset sector, which is a convergence of payments networks. When I mean convergence, I mean convergence from bank originated payment networks, which are on chain, which blockchain There's plenty of examples out there where you have between five, 10, 15 different financial institutions have come together, uh, essentially to make a much simpler, cheaper, and more efficient process for their customers. But what's interesting is now we're starting to hear discussions about for, as we move into 2025, the need for interoperability and connectivity between these bank originated payment networks with CBDC networks. And in certain parts of the world, uh, there actually have been beyond just POCs and pilots, there have been true production deployments of central bank digital currency networks. And what's interesting is what we're hearing again from many of the commercial banks is now for their institutional customers, they need to provide uh, connectivity across these different types of payment networks. And what's exciting for us is now this is no longer just an abstract concept. This is a real problem that needs to be solved. Uh, and I think for us, you know, that's something that we're very excited to contribute to. I mean, so the need for interoperability obviously is a challenge and a problem to be solved. But that brings up into my head that that'll bring up challenges around privacy. So how important is privacy to the banking capital markets industry? I mean, it's paramount. I think really there's, there's three, three components to, to how banks think about these types of transactions. One is security, one is compliance, the other is privacy. And so for us, again, we've spoken with well over 100 financial institutions over the last 18 months. And we really want to ensure that everything that we offer to regulate financial institutions <clears throat> meets those, those particular requirements. Uh, so that's what's been so exciting is many of the projects we've done and which will be announced in the coming months, um, really not only uh, are really about exploring concepts, but really about applying, solving real customer problems, but importantly, working through some of these requirements. And so one of the things that you know I'm super excited about this week in particular is Chainlink's launch uh, of a uh, support for privacy enabled transactions. Uh, and what that means is for any regulated financial institution, you can do two things. One is you can have assurance that any particular transaction that you're sending for blockchain A to blockchain B, the information is only visible, only visible to the parties that need to see that particular information. Uh, and th what that means is it's not just a particular preference by regulated financial institutions. That's what they're mandated by the regulators and the compliance organizations and so on. Um, so we're really meeting those requirements of true production grade regulated financial institutions. What that unlocks then is a whole range of different use cases where these regulated financial entities have the assurance now that if they send information using Chainlink services like CCIP, that it will be fully private. It will not be shared within organizations that don't need to see that particular information. And the second part is also you can customize the level and the types of information that can be shared as well. So there may be instances where a particular institution wants to share information with one particular counterparty, but may not want to share it to a range of other different counterparties. And so you can select and customize that level of privacy as well. So it's really that combination of meeting those higher standards of regulated financial institutions that what they're expected to operate under. Um, but at the same time, providing optionality so that they can customize and make sure that what they share in terms of privacy and what is private, what isn't private, um, is custom and, and uh, appropriate for the particular use case. So it's interesting. I mean, over the more than a decade that blockchain technology has been around, it's often been accused of being a technology in search of a problem to solve. And the past year, I've seen a lot of mainstreaming and, and financial institution adoption of, late, of, of blockchain. So we used to ask, are banks ready for blockchain? But now we're looking at how they're adopting it. How are you seeing those levels right now? Yeah, I completely agree. I and mean, I'm similarly, I've been on that journey um, for a number of years now. And, um, you know, being at, being at Cybos, it's amazing to see the contrast, even within 12 months. So 
the way I described it uh, in 2023 was you could, uh, when, you, when you thought about how banks are dealing with blockchain technology, the adoption, and importantly, the problems, the customer problems that they're solving, that adoption level, you know, last year for me in 2023 was palpable. But I think now we've seen an emergence in far greater scale adoption uh, across a wide range of use cases, across a wider range of geographies, and with a wider group and uh, array of participants. So I think we've really made that transition from it being palpable to now we're starting to see that it being tangible. Um, and these first uh, tangible points about really not just POCs and pilots, but full production scale deployments, live transactions that are being undertaken within regulated uh, financial environments. And so that really then we think about the nature of how organizations are using this as a stepping stone to then what comes next. Um, then now we're at that point where the earliest stages of scaling up some of these particular transactions. And I think given the way the banking sector works, typically organizations are looking for proof points. And of course, as with any industry, you have early adopters, you have late adopters, uh, and you've got the kind of so-called fast followers or laggards. But now what we're seeing with the adoption of blockchain technology is we're moving through that curve. And now even the laggards are actually starting to see, well, actually some of our competitors are moving in this particular uh, way. Um, some of their institutional customers are asking them what their response is as a, as a service provider. And so a lot of this is then driving a lot of action uh, down that adoption curve. So I'd say we're moving from uh, being, you know, this kind of adoption curve and the level of adoption being palpable to being tangible. And now we're seeing the earliest signs of it now starting to scale up across the sector. Nikki, I agree with you. What a difference a year makes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm.